been working on Diamondback Terrapins here at Jamaica Bay for 20 years now. This is actually our 20th year. And over the years, we've learned a tremendous amount about these animals. Um, we did it partially because these are really important animals. They're important to the ecosystem. Also because they're just fascinating. They're a lot of fun to work with. And uh, we've always incorporated very large numbers of volunteers simply because we need more help than any you know, one or two or three scientists can, can, can provide by themselves. And that has grown all by itself into a citizen science project. So this is now not only a straightforward regular science research project from a university, but at the same time it's a large-scale citizen science project and many of the kids who come out here and work have never been to Jamaica Bay before, they've never been outdoors for any serious amount of time, they've certainly never been close to a turtle before, and I can't tell you how many kids have come at the end of the season and said, you know, most amazing experience ever, I want to do this again. We get plenty of kids who come back year after year after year after their first year of doing this. Um, I think we've done a lot of good in a, in a direction that we never even planned from the beginning, and that is to get people, inter more kids interested in the environment. This year we've got 80 volunteers. Terrapins primarily eat uh, marine invertebrates, you know, snails and clams and crabs, things like that. And uh, previous studies have shown that they can have a dramatic effect on what species are found where, because they eat so many of them, and they favor some species, and they don't care to eat other species. And we know that one of the species they really like to eat uh, also uh, feeds on marsh grass. So terrapins are really important for controlling populations of the snails that eat marsh grass. So terrapins, in fact, protect marsh grass. And marsh grass, in turn, the Spartina grass, in turn, uh, protects our shorelines. Terrapins, by eating those, those, those invertebrates and keeping their numbers under control, uh, uh, strengthen our coastal marshes, and that improves coastal resiliency. Those marsh grasses are the ones that buffer us from storms that come in. So terrapins, through an indirect route, are helping protect our shorelines from storms. Terrapins uh, are affected by human behavior in a number of ways. So one of the ways is that they respond to, co to, to marine pollution. Um, and here in Jamaica Bay, one of the ways they respond to that is uh, to the nitrogen pollution. And we have a lot of nitrogen pollution in Jamaica Bay. It's getting better, but it's still really bad. And the nitrogen pollution uh, causes huge algae blooms, specifically of the sea lettuce that you can see behind me here. And that sea lettuce uh, grows and makes these huge carpets that cover everything, covers the shorelines. And the terrapins here in Jamaica Bay are different from terrapins every place else they're studied because here they eat that stuff and that's probably because it's just so abundant it covers up everything else and they really have no choice. So we find lots of this in their diets when normally we wouldn't get it. The other way that terrapins are affected by pollution is uh, all the greenhouse gases, of course, that we release into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, they cause sea level rise because of global uh, climate change. And that sea level rise affects the salt marshes. So, and that's important to terrapins because salt marshes and terrapins go hand in hand. You can't have terrapins if you don't have salt marshes. And wherever you see healthy terrapin populations, you know you've got healthy salt marshes. So sea level rise uh, affects salt marshes because as the water level rises, then the salt marshes themselves are under too much water. And under normal circumstances, what they would do would be to migrate inwards. The ones closest to the shore would thrive, the ones in the deeper water would die off, and the marsh would slowly migrate inwards. Uh, problems now are that many of our shorelines are really hardened, so the, sea, so the marshes can't move inwards, and also that it's happening at such a rapid pace that in many cases the marshes can't keep up. In addition, over the years, we've done some very, very solid science. We have a very long uh, record of, of, of scientific publications that come from this project. We have well over 2,000 terrapins that we've tagged and are out in the bay right now. Um, most of the turtles that come up now, like most of the ones we've seen this morning, they're already tagged. I mean, because we've caught them many, 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 many times in the past. And every time we catch them, we get data on their growth, we get data on their survivorship, we get data on their reproduction. And this is the kind of long-term research that has to be done. If you're gonna study a long-lived organism, you have to study them for a long time. So this is our first 20 years. I certainly anticipate we'll be doing this for at least another 20 years, uh, and maybe another 20 years after that. I mean, traditionally, people who've got this kind of project, they pass it on to the next generation. And so, you know, when the time comes, I'll be ready to do that. DEC stopped the permitting of diamondback terrapins for a number of reasons. In the early 20th century, diamondback terrapins population numbers were in decline due to over harvest for use in turtle soup. 
Um, after a moderate comeback in the last century or so, uh, a new decline started, which was a result of loss of habitat. Due to recent new declines in uh, the terrapin population because of habitat loss and an increased demand for turtle meat, it resulted in most states within the terrapins range closing the commercial harvest of diamondback terrapins. New York realized that we needed to jump on board and follow suit with the remainder of the states, otherwise we were going to be susceptible to overharvest in our waters. DEC also recently implemented regulations to require crab fishermen to attach terrapin excluder devices to crab pots to prevent terrapins from entering the pots and drowning. A lot of us got into this originally because we really like turtles, we like terrapins, and they're wonderful animals to work with. But the fact that they're so interconnected with, um, with our own uh, benefits, you know, with our own environment, with our own uh, resiliency, with our own, our own shorelines, is really, really important. And it's been an important part for why so many people are now getting more interested in terrapins, why more people are staying interested in terrapins, because you know, of the role they play in the marshes and of the importance of the marshes to us. Diamondback terrapins require sandy, soft soils for nesting above the high tide line and a diversity of marine invertebrates for their food source. A healthy population of diamondback terrapins is indicative of a healthy upland habitat and good water quality.